So we have so many wonderfully talented people in our, in our midst, and one of them is John Bellinger, who is a member of our council and does great work for the American Law Institute, and uh, he's also an expert in foreign affairs. He was the legal advisor uh, to the State Department when Condi Rice was Secretary of State during the Bush administration, and now he's at Arnold and Porter, and he heads up their global group. Uh, and John has arranged with him a very distinguished person, uh, Diane Orenslicker. I didn't quite say that right, I don't think, but anyway, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> who is a professor of, of law at American University and was the deputy for war crimes issues in the Obama administration. And they are here to enlighten us about uh, these very pressing issues that uh, we're seeing unfold before us in Ukraine. And so I will turn it over to John with great thanks to both of you. Thank you. So thank you, David, uh, and thank you to you and Ricky, uh, and particularly to Stephanie, uh, who has been my great supporter for all my years on the council. We're really going to miss you. Uh, and to all three of you and to the whole staff, just thank you from at least one council member, but I think I can speak on behalf of all of us for all you do. So thank you. Uh, to Judge Garland, I was, I was originally going to say how, what an honor it was to follow you and, uh, on stage, and congratulations on receiving the medal, and that it was hard to follow you. But then I found that you were not only a distinguished attorney general, but you're a great stand-up comic. And so that makes it even harder, because we're going to go into some really depressing <laughs> subjects here. So I'm glad we got the comic part up, up front. And then, of course, to my... Uh, my council classmate, uh, Judge Jackson, uh, just yet another big uh, congratulations on your appointment and confirmation. So you, you, make, us all, you make us all proud. Um, so uh, Diane and I are going to have a bit of a conversation here. Um, David has asked us to talk about the legal issues uh, that flow from the tragic events uh, in Ukraine. Of course, the fighting is still going on. None of us know uh, really how it is going to end uh, or whether there really will be a formal end. Uh, it doesn't look like there's going to be a negotiated solution anytime soon. Uh, and it may end up being a, some sort of a frozen conflict uh, as in uh, Korea. So we can take questions on that later, but we're really going to focus more uh, on the legal issues uh, uh, that flow from the conflict. Uh, so the invasion, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine raises, of course, not only big security issues for Europe, political issues for Europe, foreign policy issues for Europe, energy issues for Europe, uh, but it presents a unprecedented challenge for international law, international courts, and the international institutions that were set up after World War II to try to protect peace and security. So I think if there's sort of a theme here that you'll hear from both of us, this is really uh, a defining moment uh, for international law and international institutions. And the question really is, will they be able to rise to the occasion? Uh, is there going to be a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing, or will they actually be able to make a difference? I think here, too, it's too early to say, uh, but there's an awful lot that's going on uh, already. So uh, Diane and I are going to focus mostly on the international issues, but we're going to talk about some of the domestic issues that are being uh, raised already and that the Justice Department is already uh, beginning to deal with. And we will take some of your questions at, at the end if we have some time. I know we're a bit over time. Let me just set the stage a little bit. As you know, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine uh, less than three months ago on February 24th. Uh, immediately, the UN institutions sprang into action. The very next day, uh, the Security Council voted on a very strong resolution uh, that the US put forward 
uh, deploring the invasion as a violation of the UN Charter, as an act of aggression, and requiring Russia to leave. That would be a binding resolution on Russia, but of course Russia vetoed that resolution. So the action moved to the General Assembly, uh, which then voted 141 to 5, with unfortunately about 30 some odd ex, uh, abstentions, uh, again condemning uh, Russia's invasion uh, and demanding that they leave. Uh, they also suspended Russia from the Human Rights Council. Uh, Russia then promptly announced, uh, you can't fire us, we quit anyway. Um, the, uh, the Human Rights Council then, uh, without Russia on it, immediately opened uh, an investigation of the human rights violations that were going on in Ukraine, and then just last week broadened that investigation uh, uh, to examine the war crimes that we've seen in Bukha. So, you know, you're already thinking, well, does any of that mean anything? Um, and yes, Russia has ignored those actions so far, uh, but I don't think these actions are feckless in that it, uh, it shows just how isolated uh, Russia is in the world uh, when they've only got five people uh, voting for them, and that isolation will continue. Uh, before I bring Diane in, let me just mention one other thing that happened, which will be uh, the, one of the very first things was action in uh, international courts, in the International Court of Justice. Uh, within days, three days of the invasion, uh, Ukraine, represented ably by our colleagues at Covington and Burling, sued Russia in the International Court of Justice. Um, as you know, the International Court of Justice created in 1945 uh, as part of the UN system. There are 15 judges on it. Uh, countries can sue one another for violations of international law. If you don't know this, the president of the International Court of Justice, the chief justice of the world, is an American woman, uh, Joan Donahue, and who I'm proud to say was my principal deputy at the State Department and is a fantastic lawyer. So I'm glad uh, that she is on watch. So Russia had not accepted the jurisdiction of the ICJ for every case. So Ukraine had to figure a way to sue Russia. And so what they did is they sued them under the Genocide Convention uh, to which Russia is a party, uh, and they said, because Russia claimed that its invasion of Ukraine was justified because Ukraine was supposedly committing acts of genocide, uh, that this was itself a violation of the Genocide uh, Convention, that Ukraine had a right to be free from being accused of genocide. Now, amusingly, this may be about the, amusing, the only amusing thing all evening, is Russia then said, well, no, we never accused you of genocide. We invaded Ukraine as an act of self-defense from Ukraine. Now, the, uh, the International Court of Justice did not buy that, uh, and within about two weeks, issued a very strong opinion, 13 to 2, with only Russia and China voting against it, saying that Russia had to immediately cease its operations in Ukraine uh, and withdraw. Now, again, obviously, Russia hasn't done that, uh, but many countries in the world uh, take very seriously what the International Court of Justice says. This was essentially a pr preliminary measure, and that case uh, will go on, and this, again, contributes uh, to Russia's isolation. So now I want to bring in uh, Diane. What we're all seeing, sadly, in the headlines uh, uh, is what's happening every single day, not behind the scenes at the UN or at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, but what's happening every day in Ukraine. Uh, and that's the real human tragedy, uh, that Russia is committing a variety of international crimes in Ukraine. And those fall into four categories that I would like to unpack with Diane a bit. Obviously, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. And each of those is, at this point, being investigated uh, by different bodies. The principal body investigating the war crimes <coughs> is the other big international court in The Hague, the International Criminal Court. It has a new prosecutor, uh, only about 10 months on the job, a British lawyer uh, named Kareem Khan, 
uh, and he's got information uh, flowing into him. As many of you know, and we'll get to this in a minute, uh, the International Criminal Court has been controversial both internationally and in the United States. The United States is not a party. Uh, Long-standing concerns about the International Criminal Court amongst both Republicans and Democrats. So the U.S. not a party. Russia not a party. So a lot of the action is going on right now with the International Criminal Court. Uh, so Diane, what, uh, what is the prosecutor investigating? Uh, who do you think he will indict? Uh, uh, and then, most important, since Russia is not a party, uh, what sort of jurisdiction does he have over Russia? Sure. First, let me say I'm uh, delighted to be here. It's both a pleasure and an honor to uh, explore these issues with such a distinguished group of jurists, um, including uh, tonight's honoree, who, to whom our country owes um, an enormous debt. And with John, I'm delighted to learn you also have an awesome sense of humor. Um, and uh, it's also a thrill. Yeah. <laughs> For me to just be in this space with um, someone I'm looking forward to calling Justice Jackson very soon. My students will be so jealous to know that I was in the room um, with Justice Jackson. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Um, so to, to your questions, John. So first, the jurisdiction question. Um, the ICC is a treaty-based court, so its jurisdiction is based on the consent of states. And what's crucial here is that um, some years ago, seven years ago, Ukraine accepted the court's jurisdiction over atrocities committed in Ukraine. And so by virtue of that acceptance, um, the ICC prosecutor can investigate uh, the crimes that John mentioned earlier, war crimes, serious violations of the laws of armed conflict. You've been watching those in real time in the news daily. Um, crimes against humanity, which are basically inhumane acts committed as part of a mass um, or systematic attack against a civilian population. I think it's pretty safe to say that um, a prosecutor will indict some suspects with crimes against humanity as well as war crimes. And finally, genocide. Um, the court does have jurisdiction uh, since 2018 over the crime of aggression. But for that specific crime, it can't exercise jurisdiction without the consent of the state of nationality. And I'm, I'm, uh, I have moral certainty that Russia is not going to provide consent to the court um, prosecuting Russians for aggression in this area. Um, I expect that uh, Prosecutor Khan will investigate the other three crimes, which many of us in, in my field call the atrocity crimes. Yes, it's a very serious business. Um, you're, uh, I, I'm trying to remember all of your questions. How will he go about his investigation? He's already started, and one of the things that's really um, fascinating and maybe a new template for this kind of um, investigation, he's coordinating very closely with national prosecutors. Um, the um, Ukrainian government, as many of you may know, is um, deeply invested in uh, legal accountability, including criminal account, uh, accountability. Uh, the United States is actually doing an amazing job supporting Ukrainian prosecutors and training them so they can do these complex war crimes investigations. And the ICC prosecutor is collaborating very closely with those prosecutors, as well as various European uh, prosecutors. So they're um, gathering real-time evidence using really state-of-the-art uh, exciting investigative techniques. Um, what will be challenging is not documenting atrocities. Um, there, there are a large number of them, and that's a challenge for a prosecutor to manage. But the challenge for Khan will be linking the atrocities on the ground to senior suspects, and that's where uh, he's going to do have to do some very hard work, um, very detailed, uh, rigorous work as a prosecutor. So that's a great segue to my next question, which is probably the question on everybody's mind: is Is he going to indict Putin? Uh, you have written that you think he will. Would you will yeah. he indict Putin, and if so, for what? Right. So I, uh, yeah, I stuck my neck out and wrote that it's inevitable that he's going to um, indict Putin, and I think uh, he'll clearly indict him. 
for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, the charge of genocide is just so hard for a prosecutor to sustain, and international courts have been very exacting um, in the evidence they require for a genocide conviction. Um, so I'm not so confident that he would bring that charge, but I do think he will look into it, and that's absolutely warranted. And I want to unpack both genocide and aggression, because for with a bunch of lawyers in the room, I think it's actually important for people to understand the difference. But before I get there, again, people are thinking, well, okay, so much, suppose he does indict Putin. Putin's never going to be in the dock. Why is this important? Yeah, uh, so a lot of reasons, actually. Um, first of all, as the prosecutor um, of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda Tribunal said in a recent interview, you don't know what's gonna happen when you indict um, someone. And there have been legions of leaders who long seemed untouchable and who later ended up in the dock. And this prosecutor, Richard Goldstone, um, noted that everybody thought it would be impossible to bring Slobodan Milosevic, the wartime leader of Serbia to justice, but he indicted him because he had to legally. And uh, Slobodan Milosevic was in fact um, further discredited by that indictment and was uh, surrendered to the court by the successor government there. So we don't know what will happen. I'm not predicting that that's gonna happen with Putin, but you're not gonna get him in court if you don't indict him. So there's that, um, the legal point. Um, there are several other uh, things. I'll, I'll mention just maybe a couple. Um, one is that uh, I think experience suggests that an indictment of a senior leader can have the effect of signaling to enablers that they should be careful and think twice. And it might um, encourage them to peel away um, um, and to be cooperative with the prosecution. So there are some um, byproducts that are useful. But I. Personally, one of the values that I have seen um, that I think is underappreciated and super important uh, is that an investigation, a serious investigation, and by extension, um, an indictment, has uh, often been a powerful catalyst for very serious, substantial, highly professional investigations that, and here's my point, would not have happened at that level except for the involvement of an international criminal court. And that has so many knock-on effects. I already alluded to um, all of the investigative work underway in Ukraine and in other European countries. We're gonna see just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prosecutions catalyzed by um, the ICC's work. And, and they're not gonna be in The Hague, they're gonna be so elsewhere. So let's talk about that for a minute, because that, that has never happened before. So the point here is that the ICC prosecutor may indict a dozen officials. I can't imagine he really would indict more than that, 15 mm -hmm. maybe. But there are hundreds of Russian commanders, mm -hmm. soldiers who have committed war crimes. And so we are going to see and already seeing investigations by Ukraine itself mm -hmm. and by the neighboring countries. Many of you may have seen just a couple of days ago, Ukraine began its first war crimes uh, prosecution of a 21-year-old Russian soldier for shooting a civilian uh, in a village outside Kyiv. But I think you're saying we, we may see dozens of prosecutions by the Ukrainians themselves and by neighboring European countries. So mm -hmm. we could see a lot of indictments. What's the division of labor? Yeah, um, so classically, uh, the expectation has been and still is that if there is an international criminal court, it will prosecute the most senior suspects or those who are in some other way most responsible for notorious crimes. And national courts will do the vast majority of prosecutions of direct perpetrators and lower level officials. Um, I, th you know, if, if uh, Khan is gonna indict Putin, obviously to some extent, he's, he's following that pattern. But the ICC is also under a lot of pressure um, and the subject of very high expectations right now. Uh, I, I won't say all eyes are on the ICC because probably a lot of people have never heard of it, but it's, it's, it's getting a lot of visibility right now. Um, and Zelensky has placed a lot of hope in him and he's kind of a global hero. So 
uh, the prosecutor is under pressure to produce results right now. Um, a lot of people and governments have, have uh, invested hope in him. He's not going to get Putin in the dock anytime soon, if ever. Uh, and, but, and I think, as any prosecutor would, he doesn't want to have an empty courtroom. Um, so I think we will see indictments um, relatively soon of lower level officials. And, and so he won't just leave that to national courts. There will be a different kind of division of labor. Now, speaking of the most serious crimes, genocide, uh, President Biden said a few weeks ago that he thought, in his personal view, that the Russians were committing genocide, that Putin is committing genocide. And then he quickly said, but he was going to leave the decision to the lawyers. I say here, he's leaving it to my former office, the lawyers at the State Department, which puts a little bit of pressure on them when the President of the United States has said that he thinks that genocide is being committed. Um, so it does put a bit of pressure on them. And candidly, it's difficult because the Genocide Convention defines genocide as killings with the intent to uh, destroy an entire or most of a racial, national, ethnic, or religious group. So there would have to be a showing that Putin really intends to destroy an entire group. So that's hard to show that intent. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a tough one for you, Diane. Did the president go a little bit too far on this, or what do you think the prosecutor will do on genocide? Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of us have seen that political leaders and others use the concept of genocide often in a way that lawyers wouldn't use it. Um, it's in some ways become a shorthand for capturing just our outrage at what we're seeing and, the, and capturing a sense that this is so bad we can't stand by. Um, as you said, you know, very eloquently, John, it's, it's a much different matter for a prosecutor to uh, make a case of genocide. And so I have a couple of, um, I, I'm, I'm fairly conservative on this, uh, I'm using the word genocide, for two principal reasons. One is that, as you said, it's extremely hard for a prosecutor to make a case of genocide in court. But victims hear the word being used a lot before you get to a verdict. And when the verdict is to acquit um, somebody on a charge of genocide but convict them of crimes against humanity, often victims who were expecting a genocide conviction say, what, our, our suffering wasn't that bad, wasn't bad enough? And I'm, I'm thinking as an international lawyer, do you understand what crimes against humanity are? This is what, this was the principal charge that captured the Holocaust in Nuremberg. It's, it's serious, so, so I don't wanna, uh, so I'm, I'm protective of victims. I've seen how disappointed they can be um, when they don't get that charge. And the other reason I uh, am cautious is that, as I already said, these other crimes, serious war crimes and crimes against humanity are horrific. They're just horrific. Uh, and I, I don't think we need to sort of um, suggest that if it's not genocide, we don't have to act or it's not serious. Um, but I understand exactly you know, where the president was coming from. And I'm glad he's outraged. And I'm glad he's saying this is outrageous and, and we have to stop it. Now, let me ask you a question, which um, I, this is one where I think everybody in the room will have a, a view on, which is, should the US help the ICC investigate the Russians? The problem here is the US is not a party to the treaty that created the ICC. Uh, through Republican and Democratic administrations going back to President Clinton, we have expressed concerns about the ICC's jurisdiction over non-parties, saying that we think it's improper to assert jurisdiction over non-parties. So if the US sticks with that position and we're consistent, we would not help the ICC investigate the Russians. So uh, there is a big interagency debate going on uh, right now as to whether the US should support the ICC and really back off of its longstanding absolutist position that the ICC should never uh, investigate non-parties. Um, I wrote an op-ed a couple weeks ago with my law partner, Chris Dodd, whose father, you may know, was a war crimes prosecutor at Nuremberg, saying 
that whatever concerns the US may have about the ICC, and it's not a perfect institution, we should help it in this case, because this is what it was set up to do. Uh, and this is really its defining time. We should provide classified information. We should provide our best investigators and prosecutors uh, to help it do a good job. For those of you who read the Wall Street Journal, three days later, uh, my former colleague John Bolton then wrote an op-ed saying exactly the opposite, that the ICC is a flawed and corrupt institution. We should not help it and that if we're concerned about war crimes in Ukraine, we should help the Ukrainians. Um, but it is a difficult one, given the US uh, longstanding concerns about the ICC. So Diane, what, what's your view on this subject, and how do we sort of square that uh, conundrum? Yeah, um, so you know, as, you, as you indicated, the United States has uh, had a complicated and often fraught relationship with the ICC. But the United States also has a long history, and, and it's a history I'm very proud of, um, of leadership in seeking justice um, in the wake of horrific atrocities. And, um, and in some ways, the United States provided early leadership for the ICC. President Clinton gave a speech calling for an international, or at least expressing support for an international criminal court. Uh, at the Dodd Center, um, and, and that was before the ICC was negotiated. Um, and so there's been this tension. When I was in the Obama administration, I think uh, the place that the, admin, the, the administration reached was recognizing, in line with our tradition, that we want the ICC to succeed. It's in the United States' interest for the ICC to succeed. And I think you would agree with that, John. Um, what I think you were saying is that there are some cases that you would consider a failure of the ICC. And so the, the question was, how do you um, ensure that? And, and where the debate tends to come into sharp focus is when we're talking about specific cases. And when you have a situation like Ukraine, I think there is a, um, a, a moment of clarity where uh, US policy coalesces. And you have you know, this extraordinary moment for me um, where uh, the Senate passed, um, I can't remember if it was unanimously or just overwhelmingly, a resolution calling for the uh, ICC to um, get involved in Ukraine. And the resolution was introduced by Lindsey Graham, who um, expressed strong support for the ICC in this case. And so, uh, I, so where I think we are on this is, uh, thankfully, um, this administration has expressed support for this, um, uh, for the ICC's involvement in this um, particular situation. I would, uh, I hope that they will do some of the things that you called for You're an op -ed, in, in your op-ed, excuse me, uh, providing intelligence. Uh, there are a, a number of ways they can do that. That will help with this link, uh, linkage um, challenge that I mentioned earlier. But maybe in the bigger picture, I think this is a moment where we're really well poised to rethink our broader policy and put it on a more stable, solid, sustainable footing so we don't have these um, kind of fraught conversations every time there's a change in administration or a, a new situation. And I agree with you, and I frankly think that's probably what we're going to see. There are some people in this room who know what we're going to see, but I, I suspect what we will see in the next few weeks will be oh, some statement of administration position that we will help the International Criminal Court and, and uh, define the circumstances where we help the court, uh, even though we've got uh, concerns about its jurisdiction over non-parties. But it's I, very difficult for me to see how the US could sit on the fence as the ICC is investigating the Russians. So uh, another interesting issue uh, is uh, something called the crime of aggression, which basically invading a neighbor, which is what Russia has done. So they essentially are guilty of the crime of aggression. They have violated the, bed, the bedrock principle of the UN Charter, which is that you don't use force against a neighbor. The International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression except for countries who've opted out of it. And all of the big countries in the world, Russia, the US, China, India, others, have opted out of that. So the prosecutor cannot investigate Putin for the crime of aggression, even though that's really the original sin here. So a number of international lawyers have suggested that an additional tribunal, a special tribunal, be set up just to investigate the crime of aggression. 
and that essentially that Ukraine set up a aggression tribunal with the assistance of the UN General Assembly. Uh, there's some logic to this because this is really the original problem before you get to the war crimes uh, uh, is the aggression committed by Russia. Uh, on the other hand, my view, and I'm a bit skeptical of this, is that uh, one, having a proliferation of tribunals makes it very complicated, and two, having Ukraine investigate a aggression by, uh, by Russia seems to be a little bit too parochial. But I understand the argument, and, mm -hmm. and Diane, what's, what's your view? This is something the U.S. will have to decide sometime mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. Are we going to support an additional tribunal just to investigate mm -hmm. uh, aggression? So right. too many tribunals? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm glad you uh, put out the case for it. And, and it is a compelling case. And if it happened, I would applaud uh, the move for some of the reasons you suggested, and, as well as others. That said, um, I do worry about um, dissipating our support for the cases that are underway in a court that's already established that are, you know, that, that's not looking into tax, you know, cheating on your tax returns. They're looking at horrific atrocity crimes. So I, I worry about that. I also uh, wonder, just you know, as a realist, um, uh, what, how quickly such a court could be established. Um, again, you know, at a time when we're poised to move quickly on other investigations. Uh, how quickly it could happen given um, natural political anxieties about the precedent that would be set, right, by establishing uh, an aggression tribunal for this case. Um, so, so I, you know, I do have some, some uh, questions about it. I would say, though, that um, I think we're not, we're not prosecuting uh, aggression. Um, that, that is, the ICC is not prosecuting aggression. Uh, but I think that the astonishing, unprecedented support it has received for the cases it is going to investigate is almost a proxy for aggression. And it's, and, and I, 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 you know, again, literally it's not going to be able to bring that charge, but I think that um, support for its engagement is very much a reflection of revulsion at this flagrant violation of a fundamental principle of international law. I agree with you on this. I think, I don't know enough, but I think if I were still in government, I would say let the ICC bring war crimes, crimes against humanity charges, and that's a proxy for aggression. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have one more question for you, and then we'll open it up. Uh, I will say one thing about, we've been talking about international legal issues. Of course, Russia's inv uh, invasion of Ukraine is raising a host of domestic issues that I think will be with us for years, if not decades, uh, and who knows, may ultimately make it up to our friend Justice Jackson on the Supreme Court one day, uh, because there's a lot going on. We have the uh, Treasury Department has sanctioned hundreds of Russian entities and officials uh, with asset freezes. Uh, we know from Iran sanctions and others that produces lots of litigation from the people who've been sanctioned and the banks that hold the assets. Uh, the Justice Department is beginning asset, not just seizures, but uh, civil forfeitures, seizures of the property uh, of Russian oligarchs, so that raises due process concerns. Congress is considering legislation that would make it easier uh, to seize the uh, assets of oligarchs. The ACLU has already protested that, saying that raises due process concerns. Um, my friend, who many of you know, Tom Malinowski, who came out of Human Rights Watch, interestingly said, you know, the due process clause should not be triggered here because the assets owned by Russian oligarchs is not, in fact, private property. This is essentially public property that they've stolen. So I'll leave it to you judges to have to figure that one out under the, the Fifth Amendment. And then finally, a hot topic that I think we will we will probably see uh, some uh, activity on is whether the president in the United States can seize Russian sovereign assets, essentially the billions of dollars in Russian central bank assets. Right now it's frozen, but can the United States actually take it away from Russia and then use it for the reconstruction of Ukraine? This raises very serious issues under both US domestic law and under international law. So 
uh, we will be seeing these domestic issues going on for years, I think. Um, we'll open it up for questions in just a minute, and I know we're over time already, but Diane, I want to let you have the last word. So I hope end on a, a some more positive note, but I said at the beginning that you know, this really is a defining moment for international law, international courts, international institutions. There's really been nothing like this since the end of World War II. Um, mm -hmm. Can they rise to the occasion? Yeah, no, I think uh, courts have already risen to the occasion, you know, as you indicated in your opening remarks, and, and you only, you know, touched on a number of them. The European Court of Human Rights issued a, its version of a temporary injunction within days of the invasion. I mean, international, regional, and local courts are doing an amazing job in really stepping up. The challenge will be to sustain support for them over the time that they will need to carry out um, their work. And the one thing I, I so thank you for uh, asking me to say something positive because one thing I've seen over many years is that international criminal courts, you know, pretty much can never live up to the um, soaring expectations that are often directed at them. But victims are so grateful for the work they do, even when they have lots of criticisms. And so for all the uncertainties that we've talked about and the, all the uncertainties we haven't talked about, about what lies ahead in the cases uh, before the ICC, I am confident that victims will be grateful that it was involved and will see its work as part of their healing. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And I will simply say, I think the weight of all of this, maybe not on Putin, who I think does seem to be a little off his rocker, but on the rest of, uh, Russian officials on everyday Russians, the weight of all of this international law, all of these actions is going to have an impact. Uh, so with that, uh, David, how much time do we have? Can we take a couple of questions? Very good, I'm happy to ha take a couple of questions. Over there, yes, please. And I think we have microphones. Thank you, I do have microphone. My name is Irina Zavaruha. I teach international criminal law at Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, and I am a proud Ukrainian. And, oh my uh, goodness, you should be up here with us. Thank you. I appreciate you included this uh, discussion into the agenda, especially for this, for this fabulous night when we are all together and uh, can process and you will leave us with those thoughts. Uh, how to restore the peace and to achieve the justice. And I also appreciate that you started this discussion with uh, the decision of ICJ on Convention on Genocide. I want to remind that Russia brought into this war this language of genocide that was very disturbing from the very first hours of that war. And uh, I understand all the reservations of using legal language of genocide. But what is the most crucial here and the most essential is the intent. And as hard as it is to prove the intent, it is as important to understand the intent, to understand because that will be the way how to move on, how to re reach peaceful solution or understand the reason of this war or how to proceed from that. So the intent here is not just important as an element of crime, but it has more major, <laughs> it has a major importance. And here uh, I, I just want to bring to your attention that Russia consistently, Ru Russian government and President Putin is very, very consistent in his language, in all his speeches. But I also want to bring to your attention that during last at least 20 years, Russia funded into academia to publish books, articles about Ukrainian nationalism and Ukrainian Nazis. And here, I don't want to make this question rhetorical questions, that's why I will frame it as a question. So the question is, is there a work that is uh, focused on uh, 
the language of diplomats all over the globe and at the stage of the United Nations and Security Council, the language of the Russian Orthodox Church, and also uh, the work of uh, Russian historians and political scientists. Because from my perspective, that's where we can understand better the intent of all these criminal acts that are committed in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention and for this presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. And I think uh, all of us, our hearts go out to the people in Ukraine. And that's an important question. And of course, it's, it's a, incredibly hypocritical for the Russians to be accusing Ukraine of genocide uh, as an excuse to invade Ukraine. Uh, and we'll see what the prosecutor ultimately does in terms of his own investigation of Russia for genocide based on uh, the different historical facts that you have seen. So I think we've got time for one last question, um, if, there, if there are any. Yep, back here, please. Even better. I understand the reluctance to embrace genocide legally. I've been teaching these issues off and on for the last 30 years and practiced some of it. But isn't the advantage of genocide if you can get clean jurisdiction based upon evidence that the invasion involves the attempted eradication of the Ukrainian nationality? And I believe that's a legitimate basis for genocide. Uh, isn't the advantage of genocide that we don't have to worry about where, which tribunal we're going to try Putin and other Russians in? That whoever's committing genocide is fair game for any court in the world, including ours. Now, that's a scary thought, because it may mean that we have an obligation to try or prosecute and try Putin. And thinking about the implications of that goes way beyond what we have time to discuss tonight. But, but would you like to address what, what could happen if we find evidence of genocide at a level that would support uh, prosecution? Great question. Yeah. Diane. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I just want to reiterate, because this may have gotten buried in the other points I made. I do think that the prosecutor will, and, and I want to emphasize, should look for evidence of genocide. Um, so, I, you know, that's obviously got to be part of his investigation. That said, you know, I, I'm, it's very hard to sustain those charges in court. Um, could he, could Putin be prosecuted if he were to travel to other countries? Yes, lots of, lots of countries have statutes, including the United States, that make genocide a crime wherever it occurred. Uh, also, unlike the United States, many other countries have statutes prohibiting crimes against humanity um, that also enable them to prosecute people uh, suspected of committing crimes against humanity, as well as war crimes. So, so it's a world that increasingly can prosecute people, thankfully, for genocide, um, but also for other horrific atrocities. So thank you for your question. I, you know, and, and again, I think that we all should be concerned. I'm especially grateful uh, to the previous speaker for highlighting some of the evidence that, in my view, is most uh, troubling in terms of you know, being an indicator of genocide, which is the, the uh, horrific um, rhetoric of the uh, Russian government. Rhetoric doesn't even begin to capture it, but there is very troubling. Um, uh, national uh, demonizing, which many of us know is often associated with genocide. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Diane. Thank you. Well, we are adjourned uh, for, the, for the day. Thank you so much. That was so thoughtful. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back at it tomorrow morning. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the coffee and uh, the fellowship. Thank you.